It's a real joy to be here this morning and to be able to give a testimony. Uh, we must first thank uh, Scott and him and Timberley uh, Hahn that has invited us here. Uh, it, it's been amazing these days for us to be in this environment. So thank you, Scott and Kimberly, for, for having us here. So first we want to say a little bit about our background and uh, uh, we're from Sweden, both of us, uh, and uh, I um, came to uh, the knowledge of the Lord when uh, I was around 20 years old, came from, I come from a secular background and uh, met Jesus as my savior, uh, which was an amazing experience for me and turned me totally upside down. Uh, <clears throat> this was when I was uh, uh, starting uh, to leave my hometown, go to uh, the university city of Uppsala. I thought I was gonna be there for about one or two semesters, but I haven't left yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and there I came into contact with an evangelical organization called The Navigators, uh, which are very good in Bible, in Bible memorization, Bible studies, and evangelization, which helped me a lot and stabilized my life tremendously. Uh, after a couple of years, I started uh, to study after uh, taking a, a Bachelor of, of Philosophy. I started to study theology and um, eventually ended up as one of the chaplains uh, at the university, uh, which was a wonderful time to be able to evangelize among students. In the meantime, I met Birgitta uh, and uh, we got married. I think she will tell that story a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, yes, I was born in India uh, because my parents were missionaries there, Methodist uh, me missionaries. Uh, my father was a pastor. So, so I grew up there until I was 10 years old, and I really love India very, very much still. And we have visited many, many times and ministered there. Uh, but when I was 10, we came back to Sweden, and, and uh, soon in, in my teenage years, I, I was involved in, the, in a youth group in the Lutheran Church. Uh, which was very much alive and, and uh, centered around the Eucharist. It was a sort of a, could I say, a, a, a revival. Church. High church. Yeah, it was a high church. You know, the Lutheran church in Sweden is so many different groups. It's high church, it's low church, it's very liberal parts too. <laughs> we, so I enjoyed the Eucharist so much as a teenager. But then uh, uh, in my early 20s, uh, uh, I, um, I, I met the Charismatic Revival, and, and uh, I, I was sort of, um, yeah, I, live, uh, I lived in those circles for, for some years, and until I met Ulf, and uh, it was so wonderful to meet him. And to meet her. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, it, yeah, it was a, such a great blessing, and we got married in 1976. Yes, and <clears throat> so we, uh, as, as uh, I became a chaplain at the university, uh, we were involved also in the charismatic movement, and eventually that uh, led us to, we saw the hunger, uh, especially among young people, for the word of God. So we wanted to start a Bible school, and as we did that, we wanted to reach out a little bit further to, to uh, Christians uh, everywhere. And in this environment, which was the charismatic movement, uh, we eventually started a non-denominational uh, charismatic church. Uh, that church started to grow, it's called Word of Life. And uh, the, the main emphasis was actually the Bible school. People started to come from everywhere. It was really a form of a, a Bible revival. Uh, so step by step, uh, over the years, there's been thousands of young people coming uh, to this Bible school. And this Bible school also uh, reached out and um, through the students that went out evangelizing and eventually going into missions. So many other Bible schools were planted. Uh, <clears throat> this was in the 80s. And uh, we prayed a lot, and Sweden has always been praying a lot about uh, the Soviet Union and getting the gospel into the Soviet Union. And then, of course, 1989, when uh, the wall fell, the Lord gave us a, a wonderful golden opportunity and really challenged us to go into the Soviet Union. Uh, we didn't have the means for it, uh, but we had the, the passion for it. Uh, and uh, the Lord provided the means. And, uh, uh, and in a very short time, we were able to... Uh, uh, 
go all over Soviet Union that eventually became Russia and all these different uh, autonomous nations um, and preach and establish churches and establish Bible schools. So uh, after a number of years, I do this say this rather quickly now, of course, uh, they, it grew up. We did not start all of these, but it, it was a movement. It was like an avalanche, actually, uh, and a golden opportunity, uh, actually a Kairos moment to preach everywhere because they were so hungry after 70 years of communism. It, it was... Um, uh, it was like a, a, their, their hearts were just so open. And so thousands and thousands came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It, it was amazing. We had a train. Uh, we actually uh, rented a train from the KGB. Uh, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it, this is amazing because uh, we met a KGB officer uh, and he heard me preached and he said, you know, what, what, what you have, you should come and, 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 and say this in Russia. I said, I'd be happy to do it. And, and um, <clears throat> he said, I have a train uh, and it's a communist uh, propaganda train. <clears throat> Excuse me from for the um, uh, the Komsom Komsomol, which is the youth movement in the Communist Party in Russia, and he said it's not going so well for us anymore. <laughs> 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 so I said I'd be happy to to uh, rent the train from you. So we took it from Saint Petersburg to Abakan in Siberia, from Abakan in Siberia to Khabarovsk at the Japanese Sea. We did it in two summers, and every place we stopped, a church was planted. Every place we stopped, there were thousands of people that uh, came and listened and um, that received the Lord. It was, a, it was an overwhelming, it was an overwhelming experience. And this went on in, of course, in Eastern Europe and uh, into Central Asia and eventually into the Middle East and eventually uh, India, uh, China, Taiwan. So we have been very engaged in, in mission uh, in many different ways. As uh, at the same time, the local church in Uppsala, uh, that was the hub in all of this, grew uh, and it became eventually uh, the largest uh, Sunday morning attendance uh, 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 for a local congregation in Sweden. So these were, these were wonderful times and are wonderful times. But in this, something happened uh, step by step. Uh, we were in Albania, uh, and this was before the, uh, the, the, the uh, government, the communist government fell. Uh, but the culture minister was open to us, and we said, we want to come and preach the gospel in Albania. And he said, no, 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 you can't do that. I said, absolutely not. Uh, I said, can we have a culture exchange program in Albania? And he said, of course, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So we bring our choir and we sing Swedish uh, Christian songs because we're Christians. And uh, can I speak? He said, yeah, of course, you can start the meeting as long as I can end it. <laughs> uh, and and um, we said, we want two hours of television. Uh, and uh, he said, no, television, I don't know. Uh, well, we must have television. He said, we cannot do this. We want the biggest arena in uh, Tirana, the capital, and we want television. And he said, okay. Uh, there was one channel in Albania at that time. They had four hours of television per day. We got two of those. Yeah. This was 1991. We're able to preach the gospel there. Uh, I would say before the communist uh, uh, president fell, he actually called in right in the middle of the television program and demanded that they would stop it, and they didn't. We were able to preach, and we heard so many testimonies about people receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. One thing happened in Albania that, that, that shook me. Uh, a man that was uh, secretary to the next president came up happy. And he said, this is wonderful. I am also a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and this experience have not left me to this day. Because I, I was like, I'm not a Catholic. Uh, I'm a Protestant. Uh, and, and this, in a split second, this happened. I, I'm, a, I'm a Protestant. And, well, justification, I'm Lutheran. Uh, holiness, I guess I'm Methodist. Uh, <laughs> ba ba baptism, well, I'm Baptist, but I'm not really Baptist because I do believe, you know, the presence of the Holy Spirit in Baptist. This was just raising in my mind. Uh, but I'm also Pentecostal, I believe in the, in, in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I'm also charismatic because I do more than just believe one thing about the Holy Spirit <laughs> uh, and and uh, and, it was just, and and as I was thinking this I saw this uh, tree big tree and I saw this branch and I was like hanging way out here somewhere <laughs> you know when you're in something so intensive you can think you're the center uh, of the universe but you're not of course 
So in an instant I felt I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere on this tree, but very far out. So I didn't know what to say to this. How can I explain to this person that I'm not a Catholic, but I'm a Protestant, but I'm this and this and this. I couldn't, so I just said, oh, that's wonderful, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this stuck with me. This Catholic thing just got in there and stayed, it, like a seat. Yeah, that was 91. And then uh, we, we started to, to be more engaged in, in unity. We start, at least he and I, we started to think that this is, this is crazy, how divided we are. And uh, by, uh, by the millennium shift, a thousand, uh, uh, 2002, I, I started to uh, read about Saint Begitta. You know, it was her feast day two days ago. Uh, the only Swedish canonized saint, and uh, she lived in, in the 1300s. And because uh, I have her name, I, I, and because of the jubilee that was coming up, I was interested in getting to know her better. And this was uh, a trap from the Lord. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I read a big fat no novel about her life in, in the Middle Ages in Sweden. It was very interesting. Uh, and and her, 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 she moved to Rome and, and she did a lot of things. She was a very, very courageous woman and, and she fascinated me. But I, I also was very disturbed by, uh, she had uh, visions of, of, of the Lord and, and he spoke to her very much. But I was, she also had visions of Mary and she spoke to him, to her. And this, for me as a Protestant, was very strange. How can, how can Mary speak to her? This is, she must have gotten it wrong. It, she must be a little bit confused. That must have been the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? So, so, so this, this I couldn't understand. But I kept reading m more and more books about St. Birgitta and it, was, it, it, it taught me a lot uh, anyway about uh, her Catholic faith, how strong it was and how, how she was very, very, how should I say, um, careful with her theology. Uh, when, she, when she had these visions and, and locu locution, how do you say it? Locutions, you know what locutions. I mean. <laughs> she heard, and, and uh, she rushed to, to her confessor to check it out. Uh, do you think this is from God, or, or am I just d uh, making this up, dreaming? Uh, so I, I liked that about her. She was so, so careful. And maybe because she was a lawyer and the daughter of a, a, a very famous lawyer and judge, you would say, in Sweden at the time. So, so she had this mind, very clear mind. So this, this I liked, uh, but I still couldn't understand this thing about Mary. So <laughs> uh, this is about the time when we are planning to, to go away from our, uh, uh, leave our church to go to Israel for, to, uh, to start, start a study center. Be sent out from the church. Yeah, we were sent out by the church uh, to Jerusalem to start uh, a Bible uh, school and a study center. Uh, so so um, I'm reading this about Birgitta and, and now I think uh, I have to find out more about Mary now. Uh, I'm very prejudiced, I suppose. I, I know how it is to be judged uh, by other people in, in the society in Sweden. We had been um, criticized, heavily. criticized heavily, one could say, as a free church and as a, as a, a Bible-believing church, you know, we're doing missionary work. Uh, and our Swedish society uh, is not so impressed by that. <laughs> 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 so, so <laughs> anyway, I... Where am I really? Yeah. <laughs> you know something? I will do as the Pope Francis always says, please pray for me. <laughs> uh, please pray for me. Uh, so we, uh, you thought that we, were, we need to be objective here. We need to go to the documents. Yes. So, so uh, to, to really learn about Mary and to understand her, uh, and what the church teaches about her. This, this intrigued me now. And uh, I read several book, good uh, Catholic books now about Mary. Scott Holmes' books. Your yeah. book, 
Dr. Han <laughs> <laughs> came our way, one of the first ones, <laughs> together with uh, s some other books. And I loved your book, and it explained so much to me. And uh, actually, when I understood, um, I wanted to, to understand two things, the immaculate conception and the perpetual virginity. It's never talked about in, in, uh, in the evangelical charismatic free, free church world. So I, I had no idea about this. And it's very, very, very important. And I, it's actually been a problem to me because I was thinking, we know that Jesus is this God, second person in the, in the Trinity, and he was born of a woman. But how, if, if there's not something special with Mary, how can he actually take human form and be without sin if she is contaminated by sin, original sin? How? Couldn't, it didn't go together. And, and you, were, you were thinking about this for years. Yeah, I, I, I had. I have been thinking of this for years because I never heard anybody, including you, my dear husband, mm -hmm. had never... <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard. Well, I had other subjects to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, actually, when I read the, the, the words that explain her immaculate conception, uh, I, have I have it written down somewhere here, uh, and it, it was so good. Um, Ulf, help me to find it because it, it's it's uh, somewhere in here. Somewhere in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just say it because just yeah. say it because yeah. I, be, I can't say it because it's so good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. I can't find it, but you know, uh, <laughs> I read it in, in uh, Pope John Paul's little book about. Uh, was it called in Latin um, Redemptoris Mater? You know it? Yeah. yeah. There he explained it with, with very pregnant words, very strong words. And when I saw it and I had thought about it, I, I could understand it. I could see it and I could believe it. And it was a it was a very, very big blessing to me, and I, I was so happy. The puzzle that had, had a missing piece came together, finally. And I, I was very, very thankful to Jesus. <laughs> she was happy for 14 days. Oh, I'm still I mean, happy. I, I, yeah, she's still happy. But I mean, it was, it was such a... Uh, every moment, such a, you know, uh, and she talked about it uh, all the time, about this uh, immaculate conception <laughs> all the time. And, and uh, it really, really made sense. What happened when, uh, in, the, in the end of the 90s, we started to come into contact, of course, in the mission fields. There were two things that happened. Uh, first, we saw uh, some deficiencies in our own work, uh, how to handle uh, different problems, and uh, we felt we lacked some of the tools. The other, we started to uh, come in contact with uh, Catholics, living Catholics. Uh, there were charismatic Catholics, but also others. That really impressed us. And as we moved to Jerusalem to start this study, Sandy, we started to meet Catholics everywhere. Uh, I mean, you, you, in Jerusalem, you walk around, uh, you, go, the you go around the corner, and there's a Catholic there. I mean, they're, they're, uh, and, and you have to understand, we come from, it's not like Steubenville, we come from Sweden. <laughs> you don't find Catholics everywhere in Sweden. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a monk, for example, before I went to Jerusalem. Uh, I told a nun, I said, I've only seen you on postcards. So, so this is the background. Uh, and, and, and now we are in Jerusalem, we're doing our work, but at the same time we have free time, and we feel this drawing uh, from the Lord uh, closer to the Catholic Church. First, we're a little bit frightened, uh, frightened about it, but there's some irresistible here that we cannot deny. And uh, Begita is um, kind of charging on, and uh, so she starts with Mary. And I'm like, can't you start with something else? Like, you know. 
she was the for for a Protestant couple like Ulf and me. She was the uh, big hin hindrance, so to speak, uh, to to understand the Catholic belief. Yeah. So yeah. so we had to conquer that mountain first. Yes, it's true, <laughs> and and and, uh, <laughs> and 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 because I've heard many testimonies f from Protestants that that have become Catholics that that Mary was the last thing that they uh, were able to cope with. For us, it was the first thing. And it was a big, big blessing for us. We came in through Mary in this sense. Uh, I can say happy birthday and Karen. It was uh, uh, an extra blessing for Ulf and me. When we lived in Jerusalem, we, we lived in Ain Kerem, the, if you have been to the Holy Land, you know that is the place of the birth of John the Baptist. It's a small suburb of Jerusalem, a very pretty, wonderful place. So here we are in Ain Kerem, the place that Mary rushed up to, to help her, her relative Elizabeth. And we had our office just next to Mary's well in this, in this village. And we could all the time hear the church bells and, and from, from the visitation, visitation church. This is the place of visitation. Yeah. yeah. And it became so for us yeah. because this is where we understood and, and, uh, and started to really love Mary. So, and now I've, I found the, the place I was looking for. Uh, <laughs> okay. This is what was written in Pope John Paul's book. The Virgin Mary, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin. This was so logical to me and so good. So I wanted to read it to you. You know it all by heart, I'm sure. <laughs> So we were reading a lot, studying a lot, and uh, many things started to make really sense. Uh, I must admit that, uh, I mean, I understood uh, this about Mary, but I was a little bit, as a Protestant, with the background that we have in Sweden has been staunchly Protestant, now secularized, but it's been, uh, so we, we had a lot of anti-Catholicism in us just by breathing the air. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and the culture and, and the sentiments uh, that are there that we didn't, really understand uh, how deep it was. So the, th the thing about Mary, Mary of course, uh, uh, Mother of Jesus, no problem with that. Uh, but there are other things that, that are more problematic. And one night I was just uh, laying in my bed uh, wrestling this. I didn't tell Begitta that I was wrestling the, this, but I was. And uh, so oh, I don't get anywhere with this Mary thing. Uh, so I, well, I read the Bible. I just took the Bible and, 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 and it opened up. So as good charismatic, you know, you just take the verse you see. <laughs> Shouldn't do that, but in this, uh, in this case, it really worked. So, so it opened up to Matthew 1, and uh, here I, I hear, is, is I read about the angel saying to Joseph, do not fear to take Mary to yourself, unto yourself. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Yes, praise God, praise God. It was, it was exciting days there in Jerusalem for three years. And um, I, w when we started to, to understand this, we also asked ourselves, why have we never heard this before in Sweden, in, our, in our, all our Christian years? Uh, and I, I, I thought it, it is because we have sort of an iron curtain between Rome and Scandinavia, we, we just don't look that way. In the churches you, and in, in, in the media, you never hear anything about the Catholic world. So, so we were just, we, we have been afraid, actually, Philosophy. Of, the, yeah. of the Catholic Church. We have been afraid of, of it was foreign. It is foreign to, to so many Swedes, and it was to us, but now we're getting healed from that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, uh, uh, of course, we started to uh, uh, 
come across the saints. So uh, the first one that we came in, in contact with was uh, Saint Faustina. Uh, mm. I had no idea who Saint Faustina was at all. And, uh, but I, living in Jerusalem, we, I had to go over here to uh, Seattle and, and preach for a weekend and then back again. That was a long journey. But uh, uh, so with some friends, I went to a bookstore and uh, just looking for something. It was a secular bookstore, just looking for something uh, to read on the way back. And I'm passing this religious section. And this, this one book is jumping out. Now, it's not physically jumping out, but it's, <laughs> it starts sh sh like this. So I, I, I pull it out, it's a brown, and, and, it look, and it says, The Life of St. Faustina. I said, who's that? So I put it back and just went on. And then and I could just sense, beep, beep, you know. <laughs> so I said, well, nah. Uh, and, and these, I was with two very evangelical friends. <laughs> so I didn't want to buy that book. I went around uh, one more time and passed it, and, and there it was again saying, buy me. <laughs> and I looked at it again, uh, and then I looked at them, they were over there by the counter, and I said, no, nah, I don't do it. So then I went to the counter to go out, and then I said, no, oh, you can go outside. I, 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 I forgot something, so go to the car. Then I went back, bought the book, put it in a brown bag. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. <laughs> and back in Jerusalem, we both read the book and were so impressed by so many things. Actually, things that we understood, things that we have experienced, things that we, from, from our background, really made sense and, and resonated in, in our inward being, in our hearts. Uh, and that was quite amazing. So St. Faustina, John Paul II, uh, made an amazing impression on us. Uh, and uh, a journalist in Sweden asked me, you know, uh, about our church life and ministry. Is there something, in an interview, is there something you regret, he said. Uh, this was a little bit later when we were back in Sweden. Uh, but I interject this. Uh, and so uh, he said, I said, if there's anything I reject, and he was, uh, anything that I regret, and he was thinking about you know, mistakes in the ministry, possibly a scandal, something like that. Uh, and I said, no. Well, there's one thing that I regret. And he said, what is that? Uh, journalists are very curious. I said, yeah, one thing I regret that all these years, up until now, I never discovered the Pope John Paul II. And he said, what? <laughs> but I regret that. It was like we were living in parallel universes. But in Jerusalem, uh, through books and through other people's stories, we started to, to understand both the Catholic Church, dogmas, uh, and also uh, saints and personalities, and uh, not the least, St. John Paul II, which was an amazing discovery. But then we uh, moved back to Sweden again after three years. Not quite. I have a story here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, it's a very important one, because it, it, when we moved to, to Jerusalem, one of the first days we lived there, we took a walk in the old city in the Christian quarters, and I saw a little statuette yeah. of Mary yeah. uh, in, in a window. Uh, it was different from everything else. Uh, it, it, to me, it, it wasn't as, do you say kitschy? You know, you, you know the word? Too plastic? <laughs> uh, it, it was a, a sweet statue of, um, of Mary with a, a jar of water in her a left hand and, and little Jesus, a boy, on her right side. And it was so nice. So, so Swedish, wasn't it? I thought it looked Swedish. <laughs> so so, <laughs> so I, <coughs> I bought it. <laughs> and, and scribbled <coughs> in the clay, you could see the word Bethlehem. So I figured, and the man in the shop said, yeah, these are made by nuns. Okay, I, so we figured nuns in Bethlehem. Uh, and, and we really wanted, I really, really wanted to go and see more of their things, but I could never figure out where they were. In she talked a lot about this. Yeah. She wanted to go every week. She talked about it. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> she's more interested in ceramics than I am. Mm. But, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it was, there was something, there was something, there was a pull. There was, yeah, uh, there was. And, and in many ways, uh, you have been leading the way like this. There's something, yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, something, 
that, that gets stuck in you and then you just go for it until you find it. Yeah, and then I found it. But it was <coughs> just uh, a few months before we left uh, Israel in two 2005, I saw in Jerusalem Post a, a big article about nuns in uh, Beit Shemesh, another town uh, not so far from Jerusalem, and they had a, a monastery there, uh, and uh, they were making things in pottery, in you know pottery and chocolate and marmalades, and and uh, and they ha had a picture. That I I realized these are these are the nuns. They don't live in Bethlehem. I, they they live um, in Beit Shemesh, and. Uh, their name is Sisters of Bethlehem. So that's why it was scribbled Bethlehem. Okay, so immediately we, we, uh, we arranged it for a picnic with our staff. <coughs> we went there at, uh, one day and, and on, on Sabbath, the Jewish people, the Israelis love to go, actually many of them love to go to Catholic churches out in the countryside. It's, it's like a, a, a trip to another world for them. <coughs> they and, and, and it's it's yeah, nice. I think it's it's a chance for reaching out to them so that the church must not miss when all these Israelis come on, on Saturdays. So so anyway, we we went there and it started to rain and we our picnic sort of we didn't know what to do and then we met the sisters and they said come 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 in and uh, use our little room here and we sat down and had our picnic and they joined us and we. We were absolutely surrounded by angels and these three sisters, and they were so, so nice and said, please let us show you our little church. And we were, we, we liked them so much, and we, yeah, we wanted to see their church. So we walked up on the roof and then back in the back of the church and stood on a small balcony looking into their church, a, a limestone church, very simple, very beautiful. And our secretary then, her name was Abigail, and she was from America. Uh, she was, <coughs> we saw something happen with her. Yeah, I tell the whole she, she, story. She just bent, leaned over the rail and looked down in the church, because there sat a, um, one sister in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. And, and we didn't know if Abigail knew what this was. So, so Ulf whispered to her, this is, this is adoration. I know, she said. And, and, te and tears were streaming down her face. And, and we, we thought, looked at each other and said, wow. Can she know this? Yeah, and, and God is really touching her. And you know, that moment, Abigail was called back to the Catholic Church, something we didn't understand. And no, she, to us, she was a, a word of life. You know, she had been to our Bible school in Sweden. She also was Baptist, we knew that. She also was a Jewess. Because in her family, she, she also had Jewish and heritage. And this was the reason why she was in Israel. Yeah, that's why she lived now in Israel. She had immigrated. And then she tells us, no, I grew up as a Catholic. What? And, we didn't, and she we had didn't been, know that. She had been very, um, uh, she, she, she had seen our development these years to, to become more and more let, positive to. Let me tell that. What? This is funny. <laughs> Because, because Birgitta started to buy little icons and little pictures of Mary and little things. And she was giving them to Abigail all the time like this. And she said, oh, you're just like my mother. Stop this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then this happens to her. God is so good. She had left the church in, in rebellion and, and, and in her teenage years. She had left everything. And uh, not until she was over 30, she had come back to the Lord, but then through the Baptists in New York, I think it was. Mm. Uh, so, and then she had come to us. And then, then she had this drawing here. Yeah. And so she started to go down. Uh, Every Sabbath, she wanted to go there to just pray and be with the sisters. And one day she went to the, um, uh, the prioress and she said, I want to become a nun. And, and, uh, and listen to this, and the, and the, and the, uh, the priory said, well, that's wonderful, but first you must be a Catholic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yes, but, but I am uh, in, my, in my background. Okay, okay, so you're coming back, yes. Uh, so here's a, 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 a former Catholic, Baptist, charismatic, messianic Jew, Jew that now wants to become a Catholic nun. 
Uh, and so she said, do you have anybody that recommends you? Yes, my Protestant pastor. <laughs> So, so this, uh, this uh, prioress, which we now know, and we have a wonderful contact, and these Bethlehem sisters have meant so much yes. to us over the years, she looked at her and said, so you mean that a Protestant pastor is recommending a Messianic Jew to become a Catholic nun? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and then she said, then the prioress said, then there must be a God in heaven. <laughs> The olive tree. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so we go back to Sweden, uh, and and um, uh, he goes back to his um, job as a pastor. Yes. And we're very warmly welcomed back by our church there. But we have all these new experiences that we just want to share, of course, with everybody. And so, so one thing we did was to take um, colleagues, pastors, and other uh, Christian leaders that uh, used to come uh, to, for seminars to uh, listen to, to Ulf. We started to invite, uh, invite them to come with us to Rome for, for uh, sort of a educational purposes, <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, and uh, one, but first we had a private trip to, to Rome and, and we went to uh, with an American lady, a Catholic, one of the first Catholics that we got to befriend. She took us to Rome to uh, introduce us to the Pontifical Council of Christian Unity and we met some monsignors there and it was a nice little talk. We felt rather awkward. We didn't know really if they... Un uh, uh, well, it's language difference. Yeah. You know. And we were, we were very, you know, still very Protestant, and we felt stupid. We were Protestant. We felt so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was good to, to meet these wonderful men. Uh, but then we, she had gotten us tickets to the Scavi, if you know the, the excavation, below uh, St. Peter's Church. And, and it, it, that's, a, that's something everybody should go and see. And we go down there, and we in the first century, sort of walking among the graves of, of the Roman time. And, and slowly we get closer and closer to the center of this excavation. And, and we come to the place where we, where we uh, see the relics of St. Peter and what is believed to be him, and I think it is. And we stand there and look, and we're totally, totally amazed Shocked. Shocked. In a positive way. And they I mean, tell us the story how they stunned. found this. Yeah. And, and um, uh, Peter is uh, very dear to us, St. Peter. We have read so much. We have, Ulf has preached so much about Peter and his boldness, bold, boldness and, and uh, courage. So, so uh, it was a, a great moment for us. And as we go out of the church, we come up. We're just by the altar, and this is also spoke very strongly to us. He, Jesus said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And here we come up in the middle of this huge church by the altar, and we know that it's built right on top of, of the tomb of St. Peter. It's amazing. And for, uh, it, it, it really sh it shook us. So we go out, and we stand be between these huge pillars, uh, looking out on the square, St. Peter's Square, together with our American friend. And something happened that is so unusual, so so crazy, really. Uh, you see the sky, a big sky over Rome, and there's like thousands of birds always flying in big flocks, back and forth. And in one instant, all of these birds come together and make a big exclamation mark. What do you say? We were so touched down uh, by the grave and, and just looking in there. And, I, I, and as I walked out, this what Birgitta said, this is about Peter. And I was thinking, you know, is this, is this, is this true? Is it, it is Peter. And if it's Peter, 
and, and, and then what Jesus said is true, of course. He's the rock. And here the church is built on him. And I was full of this. But with the, with the questions. So we're walking out and all three of us instantly together see this for a couple of seconds. Huge, I mean, the whole sky, huge exclamation mark like this. And it's like the Lord is saying, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Yeah, it was quite Sometimes amazing. you need signs. <laughs> you need mine, but you need some signs as well. So anyway, back in Sweden, we wanted to educate our people. Really not try to drag the church into the Catholic church we, uh, at all, but to be more open because the years of... Uh, being um, occupied of talking about unity and the need of, for unity. Uh, we wanted our people to understand uh, that the body of Christ is big, it's rich, and the Catholic Church definitely not just belong to the uh, body of Christ, but in the center of the body of Christ. So we did seminars, we did tours to, uh, to uh, Rome, and uh, we've had uh, over the years a number of uh, pas pastor seminars with hundreds of pastors that we have brought together from our networks, and we taught them about this, and they were very, very open. Uh, it, it was a, actually a wonderful time, and, uh, and there were four things that we felt the Lord told us in this time, and it was, number one, that we should discover this that we really should discover what God uh, has in the Catholic Church. The second was that we should appreciate it, not be so skeptical and negative. The third thing was that we should draw closer to it. And the fourth was that we should unite with it. Now this fourth, uh, I didn't pay, sorry to say, so much attention to this fourth. Uh, uh, I, I put it back because this is too much, but to... Uh, help our people to discover, to help our people to appreciate that, that we felt that was necessary. I had an experience in Israel that was quite remarkable, and I'll tell it real quick. We were walking down a valley, a uh, Gemonite valley where we lived, uh, and there was an olive tree. Uh, and uh, as, a, as an uh, evangelical and as a charismatic and uh, preaching faith and so on, you can, you know, you have to watch it. You can be arrogant. And uh, there were times when I was arrogant. There's no question about it. And uh, the Lord dealt with that in this very instant. There is a, uh, uh, almost like a replacement theology where, where the news movement says that everything, we have replaced everybody else. And this is something that goes on in Protestant Christianity quite a bit, uh, which is a form of, uh, C.S. Lewis calls it chronological snobbery. So, the, like the latest is the best and so on, to be on the cutting edge all the time. So, we were walking down this uh, little valley and there's an old, old olive tree. It's so old that you can look right through it. It holds right through it. And I hear this little voice on the inside as I passed. This tree is dead, isn't it? So, I looked at it, I glanced at it and, and kind of nodded. Yeah, yeah, it's dead. And then I heard very distinctly, look again. So I looked again, and I saw these green leaves on these dry branches and this old trunk. And very strongly, the Holy Spirit rebuked me right there. You never again call anything dead. Because that's what we have done sometimes in arrogance and pride. You know, old churches, they're dead, you know. They're, uh, God's not moving there. He's moving here and so on. And, and, and the Lord dealt with me and with us, with this arrogance, to open our hearts, to be more humble and to appreciate what is not just has happened in the historic churches, but what is going on in the body of Christ and in the Catholic Church. And this was something that I had to share back home. And it opened the hearts of many not to um, have this attitude. And we were very happy. So I was very happy to be a happy um, unity preacher and uh, ecumenically inclined uh, pastor. Uh, but obviously that was not enough for the Lord. <laughs> no, and by this time, I'm, I'm totally convinced that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus founded and that it has been standing here for 2,000 years and now it's waiting for us. I felt that if I have now found the truth, the, the truth is what we were searching all the time, the truth. And here it is, we have seen it, we have understood it and we know it and we believe it. Then, then really, you can't say, no, thank you, Lord. Uh, 
We can't come. We have other obligations. We felt we had a lot of obligations, of course, mm -hmm. because the ministry over the years had grown and, and uh, we were working not just in Scandinavia, but in many nations. And also because in our environment, uh, there were uh, this uh, uh, anti-Catholic or the suspicion about Catholicism that was, go that was going on. So uh, I was wondering, and I came to the point that even if I wanted to, I can't. Uh, so I dragged my feet a little bit uh, because of the responsibility. We were um, uh, helped graciously by the Bishop of Sweden, a wonderful uh, Carmelite uh, monk and, and bishop. Uh, that is the first uh, Catholic, Swedish Catholic bishop since the Reformation. So the things are, 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 uh, are picking up in Sweden. It's, it's, uh, things are changing. He was a wonderful, wonderful man that understood us very well and, and that were able to help us in, in, in many ways. But I was still dragging my feet uh, until one night, two o'clock at night, I just woke up, just absolutely woke up. I usually don't. So uh, when I do many times, it is the Lord kind of nodding me. So I woke up and this was now, now we're in November, so, 2014, somewhere in that, where 13, 13, 13, 13, I'm sorry, 13. And I woke up and I heard this <laughs> voice just saying, it's time to jump into the water. <laughs> and then there's two ways you can go into the water. You can go by the way of Jonah or you can go by the way of Peter. <laughs> One way or the other, it's time to get into the water. And I kind of figured what that meant. So I said, okay. So the next morning I said, I told Birgitta, I think, it, I think it's about time now for us to do it. <laughs> so step by step leading up to the 9th of March, 2014, where we uh, caused quite a stir in our nation when we publicly declared that we, in our, in our church, uh, Sunday morning service, that we were going to be Catholics. Uh, but that was also quite a relief. And now we know that this is what we wanted to do. This is what the Lord wanted us to do. And 21st of May, 2014, we were received by Bishop Anders into the Catholic Church. Thank you.